Texas Newsmaker Saturday starts now. I call it our minor miracle. For three days, trapped in a mine in the middle of western Arizona, the closest town is Aguila that you'd know of. And take a look at this uh, forbidding landscape. And we're going to talk to uh, the miner who was in the middle of it, who went down there and he was trapped. Uh, John Waddell, his amazing story. Don't go anywhere because you are not going to believe the story. Falling down that mine shaft 100 feet, he's trapped in the darkness for three days. He can't get a cell phone out of there. He can't get any communication out of there. And no one is coming to his rescue. It is a miracle he's alive. And a miracle he's with us on Newsmaker Saturday. John, great to see you. Thank you. You too. Welcome back to the above ground world. Uh, <laughs> I like it up here. <laughs> I don't, bl but you love this whole thing. You love mining. Yes. yes Tell I me do. a little bit. We'll get, we'll get to the story of you down in this mine. You fell in when your rigging let you down. Right. We'll get to right. that in a minute. But as we look at some video of, of this area and what you do, that is an abandoned mine out there on your property that you own. Correct. And when was the first time you ever laid eyes on this thing? And the rigging, by the way, you built. Yes. Right. Yes, I built that. Uh, it took about three days to construct it. And once I was out there, I checked everything out. Everything was safe. Was that sign up when you uh, were yes. working? Okay, yes. that's not something they put up after the no. fact. No, it, it was up there. <laughs> okay, so you, you have been looking for gold in Correct. that mine for how many years? Uh, about 18 years. How have you done on that? Uh, not too bad. Uh, it's in hot spots. So you, you don't always come up with something, but... This gold runs in veins under the ground. Correct. In Correct. flat veins flat that veins. you chisel out and bring it to the surface? Yes. And yes. sell it? Yes. Uh, when, you get it, when you get the gold out, mm -hmm. who do you sell it to? How do you kind uh, of make money off it? I have buyers within my area where I live. Uh, some jeweler, jewelry companies have contacted me, uh, and they buy a little bit. They buy it and, and process it, and then they use it, or do you process no, it I as well? I process you everything, do. and when I sell it to them, it's three nine gold. All the impurities have been taken out of it. Wow! And so they use it for various reasons. Uh, a lot of people have been buying it just because the uncertainty with the market. Sure. And they're hanging on to it. Is gold a plentiful thing in Arizona? Uh, yes, it is. I don't think people, is, they think of California, right? The gold rush of the 1800s. Uh, no. The, Arizona has got a lots, really an abundance of gold. And you've been chasing this thing around for, for years. You've done yes, this. Correct. Okay, take us to, well, it was October 15th, a Monday, 10 15 in the morning. Let's take a look at that rigging again. And we took the drone out there, the Sky Fox drone with you. And this is just, uh, that opening is how big? Uh, on the top, it's about 10 feet in circle. The bottom is eight feet. It starts to narrow. Starts this to This is narrow. only the entry and exit to the mine, right? Correct. Down, the, the, the shafts run um, horizontally along the ground, a labyrinth of, of shafts, right? Yeah, one of mine time, shafts. that had caved in and I believe that is where the nest of rattlesnakes were getting in at. Yeah, we're going to get to that. John was down there. He was not alone. He had how many rattlers ended up down there? Uh, I killed three, and I could still hear rattlesnakes. Okay, you've got the me. rigging, a, seri a, la a, a rope apparatus that ties to that rig that's on the outside. Correct. And you lower yourself down in a harness around your waist? Uh, I had a harness on, all of the uh, rock climbing equipment, and it failed about 40 to 50 foot down, and it was in a free fall. Wow. And, I and had, you're bouncing around off the sides as uh, you're going, right? No. Uh, thank God I had a safety rope, and I just held on to that and tried to stop. Uh, but that didn't work. And I burned just kept, the hell out of your hands, Yeah, right? Yeah, you just ripped hands. up your hands. Uh, yeah, they were pretty well destroyed. What's the landing like? Landing was really hard. Um, as soon as I hit 
uh, my leg, I knew my leg was broke, it kicked up in front of me. Yeah, and you're, Ian, you've got the, you've got the uh, cast on still. Okay, yeah. this is the bottom. Yes, that's, that's This the is where you stayed for three days. Yes. Could you see, you could see sunlight sometimes Correct. when the sun passed directly over you. Yeah, about Do you know noon. what time that would happen? Right around the noon uh, hour? About noon, yes. You tried your cell phone. Correct. Nothing. No, no signal whatsoever. I tried everything that I possibly could to get a signal out. Did you have light down there? Because you had a miner's lamp uh, yes. on your hat. That your hat. lasted, the light lasted for about two hours. And at nighttime, when I could hear the military jets flying over. From Luke. From Luke, I would take and flash the light up the hole in hopes that maybe one of them would catch the light. And that really helped burn the light. John, who, who knew you were down there? Uh, Terry Schrader. Um, I had some other neighbor, neighbors that know that I go to the mine, and he was the one that I relied on at the time. Did you know that he would come looking for you at some point? At some point, yes. But you had no water, no food. Did you have a snack, anything on no. you? You no. had nothing? No. Oh, man. Okay, so you're down on the bottom of this thing with rattlers. Correct. Was that the first order of business was to set your leg? And you're uh, a former EMT. Yes. Um, also, by the way, a, a veteran served in Vietnam. Thank you for your service. Yes. You knew some things on how to survive, but you had to set your leg. It was dangling my, like a uh, Like a, my hinge. ankle was dangling like it was on a hinge. Um, my leg was broke at the femur, and it was off to one side. And I had to get my leg straight and set it. And the only way that I could do that was take the stick that I used for my splint and put it inside my boot and push it just as hard as I could to straighten the leg out and set the leg. And you did that? And yes, did I had to Did you get any that. relief when you did that? Uh, not really. No. no. So you're hobbling around on one leg. Did you ever consider trying to climb back up on the rope to get you at least off the bottom? or somewhere where you could get cell service? Yes, I did. Uh, once I had my splint set, I was lying down and looking up, trying to get a foothold of where I could put my one foot to get myself out of there because I did have my secondary rope. Right. And that was that your safety didn't rope. really work. That was the safety rope. There was no way to kind of, uh, uh, manufacture a way to kind of wedge your way back up? No. No, there no. was no way. Because when I grabbed hold of my safety rope, and I did stand up on the one leg, and it's all I did was spin around in circles because I had no way of stopping it. When you got down to the bottom and you're hanging out down there for the first few hours, what are you thinking? Uh, at the point, you know, so many things go through your head, I thought that I might not get out of there. It, and even early on, you thought yes, that? Yes, even early on, because it's destined where it is, and you just, you just don't know. Things happen. Um, Terry could have been in a car accident or something. And so everything's going was, swirling through your mind? Yes. And was dehydration, as this went on, was that setting in where it was also yes. messing with your mind? Yeah. Yes. Were you I, hallucinating down there? Uh, I was hallucinating. Um, oh, man. I started seeing like a uh, black cloud. I call it like the Grim Reaper. You've seen some of the commercials to sure. where it looks like rags and stuff. And out of that, I saw some animals coming out of it. And at that point, I knew that I was just totally out of it. Um, you go down at 10.15 in the morning on that Monday, October 15th. By nightfall, nothing, nobody's coming out there yet. No. Are you thinking, no. how, are you kind of calculating how long it might be until somebody... Yes, yes. ...might come out? Correct. And what are you thinking that time frame is? Tuesday? Uh, Tuesday morning is when I expected someone to come out there. And but they didn't... They didn't come out. Hold that thought. We're going to take a break here on Newsmaker Sunday. John Waddell, our minor miracle, and what a Thanksgiving it has to have been this year uh, that you were even around for it. It's a fascinating story. 
Later in the program, we're going to uh, say goodbye to Ed Pastor, um, longtime Arizona congressman, a good friend and a great guy who passed away this week. And we will uh, replay some of an interview I did with him on this program about four years ago. But we return with minor John Waddell, survived three days in the darkness at the bottom of a mine, 100 feet down. His story of getting out coming up on Newsmaker Saturday. Back with our guest, John Waddell, who is a miracle. I call him our minor miracle. He was trapped at the bottom of a mine near Aguila, Arizona, back in October for three days in the darkness, down 100 feet. We continue our conversation. You're down there when you first hit the ground. You, you've got rattlers down there. You had to kill some rattlesnakes. Correct. How did you even manage that on one leg? Uh, it was... It was kind of tough. The first one I could see because I did have a little bit of light left. And on, your, could, on your helmet light? On my helmet. And I could see that one. And when I pulled the stick off to use as a support or a, as a splint. For your leg. It was about a foot away from where I pulled the stick off. Was he ready to strike? Oh, yeah. Yes, he was ready. He was coiled up. That wow. was a smaller snake. And you could hear other ones down there. Oh, yeah, it was deafening. John, did you uh, sleep during those three days? No. That I did not know. You did not go to sleep? No, I couldn't. Because of the rattlesnakes? Uh, rattlesnakes, the pain, and wondering if I was ever going to get out of there. You thought the snakes might have been looking for you because of the warmth? Correct. Your Correct. body warmth? Yes. I did have one rattlesnake. I found an area to where I could lean up against some metal, and I had one rattlesnake go underneath my arm, and I could feel the vibration from the tail that it was rattling. <laughs> I couldn't really see it, but I could feel it going under, slithering underneath my it arm. It went right by you. And when it was out, I really don't know why, but I reached down and grabbed it, and threw it just as hard as I could up against the wall. And I don't know if that's what killed it or me beating the heck out of it with a stick because wow. it was nonstop. Uh, you had no water. You had to drink from your blisters on your hands. Correct. I had to bite the blisters. Was that any, any amount of liquid to even? Uh, no. It just wettened it up a little bit. And it what would not giving me any nourishment or... When was the first sign that, that somebody finally knew you were there? That was on Wednesday about 5.30 in the afternoon. So you'd been down there over two days? Yes. Almost three days? Yes. What was that first contact? Uh, the first contact was I was yelling help. I had lost my voice at that point. You'd been yelling trying to get uh, yes, anybody's trying attention? trying to get anyone to, to hear me. And finally, I heard, John, are you down there? And at that point, um, I broke down. Wow. I started crying because, you know, um, I knew that I was finally going to get out of there. And that was who? Who found you? Terry Schrader. Okay, and Terry knew you were alive. Yes. He could hear you. You guys yes. could communicate through the 100 feet Correct. of the hole. You never did get a cell signal out of there. You no. never got a call out. No, not Okay, then I rescuers come, right? Yes. They've got to climb down there. This was a six-hour rescue to get you out. Yes. They rappelled down there, um, and they had like a, a gurney out of metal, and they strapped me into that. They tried to get my IV started and unsuccessful. And the last... Were they I, letting you drink water? Uh, yes. So you were starting to get hydrated again. Right but not enough for them to actually get a vein to start an IV. And then they pulled you out? Uh, yes, six hours of being pulled out of the shaft. Did you think, how, how, what, what did you think the odds were when you were down there that you would be found and, and rescued? What, give me a percentage. Uh, maybe 10%. No kidding, you, got, you thought you were at that yeah. low of odds? Yeah. Your, da your daughter, Jennifer, is here in the studio today, and um, did she know you were down there? Uh, not at the time, no. No. Give us, a, you know, we are coming through the Thanksgiving period where people kind of take stock. What did you think about down there, about kind of facing the potential of not making it out? 
What crosses your mind when you're in that uh, situation? My, <clears throat> my family, my daughter, my grandkids, and through, they say like your life flashes in before you, before you die. And I did see some of that and I kept fighting saying, no, I'm, I'm gonna make it. But then that would slowly slip away and I knew that I was going to go. So you went from periods of hopefulness that you could get out to Correct. despair that you're not going to get out. Right. Matt. Um, lessons from that? About uh, what's important? Always have two people if you're going to do this. <laughs> <laughs> I actually meant what's important in life. When you start taking stock about the stuff that actually matters. Um. Does it come down to family? Comes down to family, support, and since I've been out, I've had a lot of support mm -hmm. to help me through this. Are you a religious guy? Yes. Did you pray down there? Oh, yes, I did. Several times. And how big of a factor was that? Uh, that was a big factor because I wouldn't be here now if God hadn't have brought me out of there. Are you going back down? I might, but in different circumstances. And better gear. Definitely better gear. <laughs> <John>. <laughs> and with someone else there. <laughs> John Waddell. Maybe you'll take me down there sometime, but I want to make sure we got good harnesses if we oh, do yeah. this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Better it circumstances. Great. It is great too. to see you, my friend. I am, we're, we're happy you're here. Thank you. And I know Jennifer is. So um, best of luck, John. Thank you. Thank you. When we come back, uh, we bid farewell to Ed Pastor. He'd been on this program several times. Um, a hardcore Democrat, and he liked being on this program on Fox. We had a lot of good times together. Um, we're going to replay part of my interview with him from four years ago. You will get a kick out of it. Uh, Ed Pastor, our, our farewell to him after this on Newsmaker Saturday. Thank you, John. Arizona lost to political giant this week. Ed Pastor was the first Hispanic member of the U.S. Congress, served there for 23 years out of Arizona. He passed away this week at 75. He was a politician, he was a Democrat, and he was a good friend. This is our conversation back from 2014. We have this Fox brand. You know what that means, right? Bill O'Reilly and Sean Hannity and all of that, but you have never said no to coming on the program. No, I have never. Because and I, you well, don't do a lot of this stuff. No, I don't. I, uh, I, I tend not to do it, uh, but uh, I think with you that I know I'm going to have fair questions, that uh, the responses uh, uh, are going to be honest, and uh, you accept them for the honesty, and, and we go by that. I do, and, and yeah. I've always appreciated yeah. that with you, that I think yeah. you have, um, you've never sought the limelight out. No, I never have. I, uh, what, was this, this was by design. I mean, you're in a very safe district. You win sure. every election, sure. two to one. Right. Um, 70%. You don't need it. You don't need the media stuff, but you, it's not, it doesn't float your boat either, does it? No. Uh, what I learned, and, and actually it was part, uh, my experience as a county supervisor was right. uh, that for 16 years, uh, my experience was that if you do your work, do it well, that people will remember. And there are uh, elected officials who want to have a press conference for everything. Uh, they see a TV camera and they want to run to it. <laughs> uh, like you know, lost to the flame, right? <laughs> well, you know, they, you, they, they'll run you over. And I, I always felt that uh, I would rather, in my announcement, when I announced for Congress, I said, I am going to be a workhorse, no, not a show horse. And that was uh, uh, basically who I said, I'm going to work hard and I'm going to meet uh, your requirements and your needs. And I'm not going to be on, on TV unless, obviously, if asked and uh, if the opportunity comes. But no, I, I, I don't believe in that. Did, did you not announce that you weren't running by Tweet. You did it by Twitter, didn't yes, you? Yes, I did. <laughs> Does that show you how far we've come in, in 23, 24 years? Well, uh, some people are surprised that I even did that. <laughs> are you on there a fair amount? What's that? Are you on there no, a fair amount? No, you're not. No, because some, people were surprised. <laughs> yeah, that came out of left field. Yeah. Tell me why you're not running again. Sure. Uh, well, uh, I, I've been thinking about it for a while. You know, uh, I'm now 70. 
I'll be 71 years this year, and I, I thought, well, you know, it's time to uh, 16 years as a county supervisor, 23 years, uh, 38 years of public life is probably, you know, a good, uh, good career. And uh, the kids, and you met my grandchildren, sure, of course, the yeah. kids are getting older, and I missed out on my first one and all that. I said, you know what, maybe it's time for a new career to do something new. So in January of uh, 1913, uh, I spent New Year's Eve in Washington, D.C. because... 2013. Uh, 2013. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'm losing my memory already. 1913. Uh, yeah, I'm thinking, 1930. wow, this wow. guy has had a career. Well, I had a career. Uh, 2013, uh, January 2013. Uh, I spent New Year's Eve in, uh, in the House floor waiting for a bill to, to happen because that was the time of the fiscal cliff. Yes. And so here I am in uh, D.C. Uh, bringing on the New Year. Uh, 2013, uh, that whole year uh, for me was a, uh, a different year because a lot of my friends either retired or lost campaigns. A brand new bunch of new members came in. And I started thinking about it. You know, is it uh, time to go? Uh, the winter of uh, 2013 uh, was a harsh one. God awful. And uh, delays in airports. And I said to myself, uh, you know, what the hell is this? Yeah, you know, why do you need on? it? Why do why, need, you don't why do need, need the it? headache, right? So when I came home in February after a, a terrible uh, flight schedule, um, I, I sat down. It was at 1030, and my wife was watching Jay Leno because it was his last night on TV. And so she was said, this is Jay Leno's last night. Let's watch a little bit of it. And, and so I said, and Jay Leno said, I've been at this for 20-some-odd years. I've had a good career, and it's time for me to go. So at the end of the program, I told my wife, I said, uh, you know what? I think it's time for me to go, too. No kidding. Yeah. That's really when it kind yeah, of really came to you. Kind of gel. Yep. You took over for Mo Udall in right. 1991. You, there was a special election. I remember it well. We covered right. it when I was working in Tucson. How much did his legacy weigh on you, that you were, um, you were going into a guy <laughs> who was a legend? Well, it, it weighed a lot uh, because uh, as we were developing the campaign, uh, we never use the term succeed. Uh, we never use the term replace. replace. We never, we, very, with, with uh, a lot of practice, it was always if we are able to succeed, it was never replace. And it was interesting because uh, after the primary, uh, my opponent uh, was a county supervisor from uh, uh, Yuma, Pat Connor, and I was a county supervisor for Maricopa County. And it was interesting because the, uh, the day after the primary, uh, the Arizona Republic had an editorial like, where are these two clowns and what are they going to do? <laughs> and so... <laughs> <laughs> How's your relationship been, been with the Republic through the years? Well, you know, that, that, <laughs> you know so, so yeah, the answer is yes. People had very low expectations. And so uh, uh, I remember in Tucson, uh, uh, the headlines in Tucson, Pastor wins, Tucson loses, because here you have a guy from basically yeah. from Phoenix. Right, right. Uh, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. I remember that, actually, <laughs> being so, discussed. You know, they're saying, well, you know, what's going to happen to us? And so uh, knowing that, then it became uh, a determination and possibly an accomplishment that you talked about to say, you know what, I'm going to work again, work as, as hard as I can so that when I leave, office one day that they will say he did a good job mm -hmm. and I was glad he was here. Okay? What won't you miss about DC? What won't or I? Or the job? Well it, it, lately it's the travel you know <laughs> people say well do you know what you're not going to be doing? Yep I'm not going to be at the airport. <laughs> <laughs> and you fly coach right? I fly coach or I, you know I, I have flown six million miles. Wow. I have flown six million miles and so on occasion I get an upgrade. <laughs> Do you think there should be term limits? You've been in there a long time. Should no. we term limit these guys? No, no. Uh, because uh, I, I, I think that if a person is, is doing uh, a good job, uh, that his constituents uh, should bring him back. Great to see him. Thank you very much. Always a pleasure. Always. And thank you. Thank, thank you, you for coming we'll on the program. Again. We have some Democrats who don't like to come on the program, but you're not one of them. You always come on and we appreciate it. I enjoy your it. company and thank you very much. Likewise. I absolutely loved Ed Pastor, just a great guy. Godspeed, Congressman. We'll see you next week on Newsmaker Saturday.